so um, just a couple quick things before we get started uh, with today's material. Um, so I have changed the uh, assignment on the literary reflection slightly. Um, not much. I mean, there, there's still um, 500 pa There's still 500 word, word papers. You still have to do five of them. Um, but um, <clears throat> what I have added to the assignment sheet right now is some uh, notes on the theoretical approaches that I've been giving you over the past um, over the past couple of sessions. Right. So what I would like you to do with these literary reflection pieces, right? I'd like you to try to apply one of those theoretical lenses to the text you're writing about and see if you can come up with some kind of like preliminary thesis, right? If I was going to write a longer paper about this, what might my basic argument be, right? Using this particular approach. Um, so, um, you don't have to use the approach that you were specifically assigned for a text. You don't have to use the approach that we talked about on that day for a text. If you want to try something else, um, right? All of the expl all the explanatory sheets are available in Georgia View. Everybody has all the handouts, right? So you should be able to try out anything that you want to do. Um, today is actually the last day I'm going to be introducing those things to you. Um, it's the last day for a little while. We're going to be doing uh, group work. We're going to be moving on to poetry on Thursday, and I want you guys to try to work through the poems on your own, right? So we've been working through the short stories in groups. Um, I want you to try to work through the poems by yourselves. Now, I do have a handout for you. I didn't put this together. This is something. Uh, that appeared in uh, the Atlantic magazine a few years ago. And it's 20 strategies for reading a poem. Some of these are a little bit tongue in cheek. Some of these are actually practically useful. So we're going to focus for today on the ones in here that are practically useful. I also apologize that the bottom of the page got cut off. Sometimes you print things out from the internet in that computer lab, things get screwy. Um, so let's start with the actual practical advice here. Um, first, right, number one here, right, dispel the notion that reading poetry is going to dramatically change your life. Your life is continually changing. Most of the time, you're simply too busy to pay enough attention to it. Poems ask you to pay attention, that's all. Now, the, the actual piece of advice here, right, is that when you are reading poetry, this requires sustained, quiet attention, right? It's kind of like, um, you know, when I would give you, say, 15 minutes in class early in the semester to look at a picture and try to make as many observations as you could about it, right? When you are trying, when you're reading poetry, go slow and don't worry if you don't get it right away, right? If you don't get it right away, keep reading, right? Go over it again, keep thinking about it, keep looking at the way the pieces fit together, right? Understanding poetry requires slow, sustained attention. Second, when you read a poem, especially a poem not meant to be a spoken word poem, Always read it out loud. Never mind what they said in grammar school. To subvocalize it, you won't bother your peers. Your ear will pick up more than your head will allow. That is, the ear will tell the mind what to think. This is actually really good advice because poetry is, by and large, not meant to be simply read on a page. Right? You will pick up more meaning. You will understand it better if you read it out loud and listen to the sounds you make while you read. Right? <clears throat> Repetitive sounds in poetry create patterns of meaning. So look for alliter listen for alliteration, listen for rhyme, listen for things that look like they ought to be rhyme but aren't. Right? Those are often signs that something is up in a poem. Right? Those are often points that you should pay attention to. If you listen to the rhythms of a poem, we'll go into this in more detail next time. 
or in listening to the rhythms of the poem, right, is this fast, is this slow, can also tell you a lot about how you're supposed to be reading this. All right. Number three, try to meet a poem on its own terms, not yours. If you have to relate to a poem in order to understand it, you aren't reading it sufficiently. In other words, don't try to fit the poem into your life. Try to see what world the poem creates. Then if you are lucky, its world will help you re-see our own. So you'll recall maybe what I said um, earlier in the semester about context, right? We tend to try to relate everything we encounter to contexts that we're familiar with. And sometimes those contexts aren't appropriate for what it is we're looking at, right? Or those contexts that we grew up in cause us to misunderstand what it is that we're looking at. I'm going to give you um, an example. Um, I'm going to put a poem up on the screen here. Um, I am going to warn you, before I put this up, that many of you will probably find this poem offensive, like extremely offensive. Um, but please just um, believe that I have your best interests at heart and that I am trying to prove a valid point here, all right? This is the 16th poem, the 16th lyric by the Roman poet Catullus. Up yours and sucks to the pair of you, Queen Aurelius, Furious the faggot, who dare judge me on the basis of my verses. They may be many, does that make me indecent? Squeaky clean, that's what every proper poet's person should be, but not his bloody squiblets, which in the last resort lacks salt and flavor, if not unmanly and rather less than decent. Just the ticket to work a furious itch up, I won't say in boys, but in those hirsute clods incapable of wiggling their hard haunches. Just because you've read about my countless thousand kisses, you think I'm less than virile? Up yours and sucks to the pair of you. So, I have actually chosen one of the least offensive translations of this poem. Um, in the original Latin, it's a lot filthier. But the reason I choose this as an example, right, is that the poem just seems like a nasty insult to whoever Aurelius and Furious are, right, if you don't know anything about ancient Roman gender discourses, right, or ancient Roman ideas of sexuality, right? So to the ancient, to an ancient, to the ancient Romans, right, masculinity was highly prized, right? To the point where, uh, where if you were a woman, you didn't have your own name, right? Your name was just the feminine form of your father's name. So, uh, uh, Cammie, what, what's, what's, what's your father's name? Sean. Sean? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if you, were an, if you were an ancient Roman woman, your name would just be Shauna. And if you had a younger sister, you would be Shauna Prima, and she would be Shauna Secunda, right? So we're talking about a society in which women and femininity mattered very little, right? So to be accused of being feminine to a Roman man is an enormous insult and has nothing really to do with one's perceived sexuality, right? The Romans didn't have a concept, like a binary concept of straight or gay, right? That's actually relatively recent uh, modern development. Um, to the Romans, as long as a man was acting like a man in his sexual life, it didn't matter who his partners were. 
So that is why there is so much emphasis on manly bedroom behavior, shall we say, right? So there's more going on in this poem that we can see if we understand the actual social context in which it was produced, right? There are things that we might, you know, we, we might simply dismiss a lot of this as mere nasty invective if we know very little about ancient Roman discourses of gender and sexuality, yes? All right, to give you another example, a much cleaner, less obviously offensive example, well, less offensive period example. This is the earliest poem in the English language that we know of. It's called Cademon's Hymn. It was supposedly composed spontaneously by an illiterate stable hand who worked in a monastery. His name was Cademon. And the poem goes something like this, right? Nu visholen herin, kionfrikus word, methodus mikta in his mulkathank, work wulderfather, swahi wundergewiss, eke dreden ord on stalbe. He arish geshop, korthen biarnum, kionfrikus harofa halik shivend. Na midden geerd, monkinus word, eke dreden, efter teoda, firm folden, frea al mictig. Now, if we translate this into modern English, right, this is Anglo-Saxon, we get something like this, right? Praise now to the keeper of the kingdom of heaven, the power of the creator, the profound mind of the glorious father, who fashioned the beginning of every wonder, the eternal Lord. For the children of men, he, for, he made first heaven as a roof, the holy creator. Then the Lord of mankind, the everlasting shepherd, ordained in the midst as a dwelling place, Almighty Lord, the Middle Earth for men. So, the activity described here of creation, right, is described in terms of building a house, right? Heaven is a roof, and Earth is the house, right? Now, this is actually borrowing from older. Germanic pagan ideas of what the world looked like, right? Like what the cosmos looked like, right? That the uh, you know the universe was a was an enormous tree, like it was a gigantic ash tree, and in the middle of that tree was built or a house or a mead hall, which is where human beings lived, called Midgard or Middle Earth. And the roof of that was formed by branches that formed Asgard, the home of the gods. So what this poet is doing is translating concepts from an earlier tradition into what was then a new Christian tradition, right? But again, if you don't know anything about the social historical context of the poem, you miss this. You don't get this, right? So what I am trying, what, all I am trying to suggest here, right, is that you do need to learn something about the context in which a poem is written in order to really fully understand it. Right? Read the poem on its terms, not yours. Don't expect that it's trying to speak something specifically to you. All right. Number four relates back to that, fir uh, that <coughs> first point, right, about sustained attention, right? Whether or not you were conscious of it, you were always looking for an excuse to stop reading a poem and move on to another poem or do something else, right? Resist that urge. Stick with it until you feel you understand it. Number six. I cannot stress this enough, right? If you do not know what a word means, look it up. This is not hard. This is easy to do. Number eight is also important here. A poem has no hidden meaning. Only meanings you've not realized are right in front of you. Discerning subtleties takes practice. Reading poetry is a convention like anything else, and you learn the rules of it like anything else, uh, e.g. driving a car or baking a cake, right? So <clears throat> I'm able to pick up certain subtleties in a poem like this 
that you guys wouldn't pick up on immediately, largely because I'm older than you are, I've read more books, and I've been doing this longer, right? I've been doing this for a living, right? Reading poetry takes practice. Understanding poetry takes practice. Um, and the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Number 13, this one gets cut off, unfortunately. But uh, this is um, actually really, really important advice. There's this perform more marginalia, what that means, like, write in your books. <clears throat> write next to the poem. <clears throat> Scribble notes next to the poem, right? This word means this, or this is the, these are the connotations of this word, right? Draw lines linking up rhyming words or related concepts. Physically engaging with the poem on the page will help you understand it, and it'll help it stick. Right, what else? What else is important? Okay, number 15. Poetry depends on pattern and variation, even non-linear, non-narrative, anti-poetic poetry. Right, so when we're reading a story, what we're expecting is narrative, right? We're expecting, you know, at least to some extent, there's you know going to be a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the story is going to describe some kind of event or action, yeah? We don't get that in most poetry, right? Particularly not the poetry that we're going to be reading in this class. Right? There is such a thing as narrative poetry, right? Like, how many of you have read, um, you know, the ancient epics like uh, the Odyssey or Beowulf? Um, you know, Dante's Inferno, Milton's Paradise Lost, things like that, right? These are all narrative poems, right? They're written in verse, but they tell a story. We're going to be looking instead at lyric poetry, and you don't read lyric poetry the same way you read narrative anything, right? A lyric typically is an expression of an idea or an emotion put into verse, or in some cases, A revelation of the character of the speaker of the poem. Right. The character either, the speaker either directly or indirectly giving you information about himself or his or herself. Right, so you're not looking for a plot in these poems. They don't have plots. We'll talk about what to look for instead in a minute. All right, anything else? Anything else that, right? Okay, number 16, right, as your ability to read poems improves, so will your ability to read just about everything else, right? Because you will have, in order to understand poetry, you have to pay close attention to detail. And this will train your brain to pay close attention to the details of other things that you are reading as well. Um, oh, this is a good number 18, right? The best way to read a poem is perhaps to be young, intelligent, and slightly drunk. There is no doubt, however, that reading poems in old age cultivates a desire to have read more poems in youth. Um, now, don't, don't take this as me telling you to go out and get loaded, right? I, know both, I think most of you are under 21. But, um, yeah, you know, just, um, if you cultivate the habit of reading poetry when you're younger, it means a lot more to you when you're older. Uh, okay, so any questions about any of this? Okay, I will take your generalized assignments to mean no. All right, then I want I want to try something quickly here. I'm going to put two poems side by side. One of these is a <laughs> regarded as a timeless classic trademark um, that is always published um, in English literature anthologies. The other is a largely forgotten poem 
by an obscure poet um, who no one really reads anymore. They're both on exactly the same subject. What I want you to do here is read these two poems side by side, right? Each of the, right, this is poem one, this is poem two. And I want you to tell me which one you think is the timeless classic and which one you think is the forgotten obscurity and why. Take your time and make sure you have something to back up your answer. I noticed that, I don't know if it makes me or not, but I would say perhaps the first one was the forgotten one. I don't know. I'm just thinking I see more, I guess, word, rhyming words in the second one, and it's kind of more, kind of more clear to understand in my, in what I'm, the way I'm reading it, really, I'm thinking it's more clear, more modern. Okay, so the Okay, so, so so yeah, so the the rhyme seems a little more regular and the um, the point of the second poem is more clear. It kind of tells you what to think, right? Is there anybody who disagrees? two is actually the forgotten obscurity for exactly those reasons because the rhyme scheme is very sing-song and regular and very conventional it doesn't do anything particularly inventive but it looks like a poem is supposed to look um, and because it tells us what the message of the poem is right because it just comes right out and says Oh hey, this lost, you know, this city was destroyed. London could be destroyed one day too, right? And then we'll be standing amidst these ruins looking around, looking confused. The first poem gets the same message across, but you have to connect the dots for yourself, right? It's a little more ambiguous, right? I'm mean, a traveler from an antique land who said, "To vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand half sunk." A shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. 
And on the pedestal, these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. So what this poem does, it does entirely through imagery, right? It doesn't tell you what to think about those images, but it gives you the shattered statue with its message about, you know, the king's power, right? And shows you that around that pedestal, all of these works that you're supposed to, like, well, where the hell are they, right? They're gone. So it's communicating the same idea, but it's communicating it through imagery and through a certain level of ambiguity. So what this should tell you, right, is what sorts of things are valued in reading poetry. Right, this poem, the first poem is by Percy Shelley. The second is by a guy named Horace Smith, who actually specialized in doing uh, parodies and pastiches of other early 19th century, or early 19th century British poets. Okay, so as far as what I want you looking for in the poems that you're reading for Thursday, the primary thing I want you to be concerned with, the primary thing I want you to worry about, the big question I want you to try to answer, where the hell is the eraser? be able to identify an individual, right? What you're going to want to sort of go, go with is more like sort of what kind of person is the speaker? Right? What can you tell about the speaker's profession or interests or personality or values based on the poem, right? What does the speaker in the poem reveal about him or herself. And another thing to, uh, you know, to keep in mind here, please, please remember this point, right? The speaker is an invented persona. The speaker is not necessarily the poet. And even if the speaker is supposed to be taken as the poet, right? It's the poet's invented mask, right? It's the poet's invented persona. So do not identify the speaker in the poem too closely with the, with the poet, okay? All right. Any questions about any of this? All right. Great. Then you might as well split up into the groups uh, for today. So we have the Marxist group over. It looks like you already are split up. Right, because they just went half and half down the road. No. All right. Oh, you're a Marxist. All right, so right, Marxists over here, new historicists over there. Yes. All right. So go ahead and begin. You all know what to do by now, right? Yeah. And I'll be around to chat with all of you once you're underway. No, Mark, Mark, just stay, just, yeah, stay here. You guys are, you guys are here. I forgot who I put where. <laughs> 